six five, and yeah, we can start. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, myself, Gaurav, coordinator of IBEC, and after a long break, we are uh, back with the second part of IBEC APSD talk series. And kickstarting this part today, we have with us Mr. Navin Shridhar. Um, welcome, sir. Uh, before we start with the talk, I would like to give a short introduction of the speaker. So Navin Shridhar received his uh, BSMS in physics at Iser Bhopal in the summer of 2018. He is infamously known as the founder of IBEC and IBQC, two of the institute's most significant clubs, and held the post of Science Council Secretary from 2014 to 2016. He was, um, he was selected for uh, several research fellowships during his term as an undergraduate, such as SERF, Fintax Global Link Research Internship, VSP at IIA, VSRP at T4, and IA Summer Research Inst uh, Fellowship at ISRO. He received the Dean's Fellowship for Graduate Study at Columbia University and hence proceeded to receive his Master's in Astronomy at Columbia University, New York in October 2020. At Columbia, he was endowed with uh, the Ye Family Endowment Fellowship and is currently a part of a CCA Plasma uh, Astrophysics Program under Siemens Foundation. He is currently pursuing his PhD in astronomy at Columbia University and has continued his quest to more developing young minds by volunteering at several talks and conferences. And today he will be giving a talk titled What Powers the High Energy X-rays Emitted from Black Holes? And we will be having Q&A session at the end of the talk. You can keep posting your questions in the chat box. Also, if you have any clarification in between the talk, you can straight away uh, raise your hand and ask the question for clarification. And yeah, we will take note of all the questions. And now I welcome Sir to take over from here. Um, thank you, Goro. And uh, as I've always said, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back at IBAC um, to discuss uh, my experiences or to discuss the science that I've been doing. And I'm, and I'm happily sporting my uh, ISR Bhopal uh, jacket now uh, for this meeting. Um, all right, let's get into the science part now. And yeah, please feel free to jump in if you have any clarification related questions because uh, and then we can have detailed discussions at the end of the talk so um <clears throat> yeah what powers the high energy non-thermal x-rays from x-ray binaries is uh, is what uh, i'm trying to address in this uh, talk uh, i've taken the privilege of being a little more technical in this because uh, i guess i'm uh, i guess the audience is um, physics and astronomy inclined students and some of you are even majors so uh, if some of the technical aspects are not clear, please stop me whenever it is not clear. So even taking a step back, uh, what is a black hole corona? And uh, what powers the corona? And how a corona is formed are certain of certain questions that uh, we'll be addressing in this question. And what are some observed signatures from a black hole corona? So this is an artistic depiction of a black hole X-ray binary. So Typically, black holes live with a companion, okay? So they come in pairs. So you have a black hole, and then you have a companion star, and uh, the black hole accretes or sucks matter from a companion star. So here, this is the companion star. It's sucking, uh, the black hole is sucking matter from it. It forms a disk-like structure called the accretion disk through which the matter falls into the black hole. And during this process, uh, many exciting uh, observational signatures are emitted from the source, for example, uh, highly relativistic uh, jets are seen. These jets can be uh, they, they they can span several orders of they can span uh, in size several orders of magnitude larger than this uh, black hole system itself, and they can emb they can emit in radio gamma rays and so on and so forth. So during this phase, during this accretion phase, black holes go through something called uh, outbursts. So these are the uh, phases where the luminosity of the black hole system increases by several orders of magnitude. And then uh, this outburst lasts for a few uh, months to sometimes even years, and then they fade back to quiescence. So during this outburst, the black hole is predominantly seen in X-rays. They are very bright in X-rays because uh, because of thermal black body radiation. So you just take some object, you heat it up to a million Kelvin, it will start emitting an uh, X-ray X -ray band. That's what you see here. So that's the accretion disk when, when it's heated due to various viscous and other uh, effects, it starts emitting an X-ray band. That's what you see here. 
So this is a this is how a typical light curve of a black hole extremity looks like during an outburst. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the luminosity, and in the x-axis, I've shown something called spectral slope or hardness. So X-ray hardness is a measure of how how energetic the X-rays are coming from this black hole. So during the onset of a black hole, onset of an outburst, which starts somewhere over here, the X-rays are typically very energetic. And uh, as the as the outburst proceeds, the let me okay yeah, let me show you okay. And as the, okay, so during here, when the, at, at low luminosities, when an outburst starts, the X-ray that we receive are typically very high energy, high highly energetic. And during the peak of an outburst, somewhere over here, the energy, the energy of uh, an average photon, X-ray photon is very less. Note that the energy is less, but the luminosity is more. That, that's the takeaway point from here. And the top two panels here, uh, they show what an energy spectrum looks like. The x-axis here is energy, I've cut it out. And the y-axis is the flux. And as you can see, at, at higher energies, the flux is large. But in soft states, at higher energy, the flux is lower. That, that, so these are two, two, uh, two states during an outburst. <clears throat> Uh, so I'll dissect more into the spectrum to, to show what constitutes the X-ray spectrum from black holes. Um, we have this accretion disk, which is heated up, like, like I said before, and they emit thermal black body emission, which typically peaks in X-ray band because of uh, uh, their millions of Kelvin temperature, and they constitute the black body component. The, the black solid line that you see here is the overall spectrum and the dashed lines are the different components that make up this black colored uh, overall spectrum and the dotted lines here are the observational um, data points okay so the purple line that you see here is is that is giving rise to this uh, bump it is coming from the accretion disk itself uh, black body uh, black body uh, radiation and then what we think happens is that these uh, soft X-ray photons, I'm going to call the disk photons as soft X-ray photons because they are low in energy. You see here, they, are, they constitute the low energy um, part of the spectrum. These photons, we think that they get Compton upscattered by hot electrons in what, what's, what we, what's called a corona. Uh, you may have heard that the sun also has a corona, which has uh, a very high temperature. Similarly, there is also a corona uh, in black hole accretion disks, and we think that the soft X-ray photons are Compton upscattered to higher energies by this corona. And these high energy photons constitute the high energy tail observed in the spectrum. That's what we think. So since the hot electrons here are uh, giving off their energy due to Compton scattering to these soft, low energy photons, these hot electrons should cool down. Uh, but what keeps the corona or what keeps the electron positron plasma in the corona continually energized despite this inverse Compton or IC scattering uh, is a big question that <clears throat> uh, we don't have an answer for. It's, it's, it's still been a mystery. So one possibility could be uh, that the underlying engine could be bulk motions due to relativistic magnetic reconnection. So this is a lot to process now. Uh, let me break it down. So the, what is the question here? The question is, okay, you have hot electrons. They are energizing the low energy photons. And then uh, as a result of which you receive, you receive uh, high energy non-thermal photons that from here, what keeps the electrons continually energized is the question. So one possibility could be magnetic reconnection. So what is magnetic reconnection? So this is the change in the uh, magnetic field topology uh, involving breaking and joining of oppositely oriented magnetic field lines. So here you see that the, in the red one, the field lines are pointed towards the right side and the, the bottom one, blue lines, they are pointed towards left side. When they come closer, the oppositely oriented field lines, they touch and they snap into each other and then they become uh, 
uh, what you, they become something similar to what you see in the left and right parts of this uh, GIF or GIF, and they pull the plasma away from the central layer. That's what magnetic reconnection is. This is a this is a resistive plasma phenomenon. Uh, so as a result of magnetic reconnection, it uh, uh, the plasma which undergoes magnetic reconnection gets energized because the magnetic the energy in the magnetic field lines is now transferred to the plasma and the energy can be can can take the form of internal energy of the particles uh, or temperature uh, or it can take the form of bulk motions of the particle particles so uh, yeah so you, you lose energy in some sense from the magnetic field lines and then you pump it into the plasma uh, we know that the magnetic reconnection is a very natural phenomenon, and we have observed it occurring in several close by places. For example, we know that it occurs uh, on Sun. It has been observed, and we also know that it occurs um, within our own Earth's magnetosphere. For example, if you have a solar fit, solar wind hitting the Earth, you just notice the orientation of these field lines here. Uh, the oppositely oriented field lines will connect here and then it accelerates particles over here and then these particles will travel across the field lines and then as someone some of you might have guessed this gives rise to aurora borealis aurora um, australis so yeah so these are this is a this is a phenomena that is known to occur and uh, we speculate that this could be one of the in a, in a, one of the engines that, that could be powering the corona. So uh, I'm, I'm showing here a simulation of force general relativistic force free simulation. Uh, what I mean by that is the equatorial plane that you see here is the accretion disk that I showed you earlier. And these curves are the magnetic field lines and the different colors and the different uh, shades of line denote whether they are, these are toroidally oriented or toroidally oriented field lines. And uh, what happens is when matter is up, getting accreted uh, into the black hole, the field lines that are anchored onto the accretion disk, they get sheared, they, they, they move because some regions of the accretion disk uh, that are closer to the black hole move at different speeds than the regions that are far away from the black hole. So when uh, field lines are anchored at different radius, radii, so they get sheared and this shearing motion can, uh, can uh, can bring two oppositely oriented field lines closer together and that can lead to reconnection magnetic reconnection and that and that's what is seen in this uh, global simulation what i mean by force free simulation is that uh, here the effects of uh, uh, the the thermal motion of the plasma for example are ignored and or it's, it's only considered that the plasma is dominated by the fields, the, by the energy in the fields, and not by the energy in the uh, thermal or the other plasma inertia itself. So what you see here is that these oppositely oriented field lines reconnect at uh, various instances, for example, over here, and they give rise to these islands, these islands of coherent magnetic structures. So for you see, you see here, uh, these islands are, are called plasmoids and uh, these are natural consequences of several plasma instabilities that happen when, a mag when magnetic reconnection occurs and these plasmoids traverse at, uh, at translativistic speeds for a, for, a, for a good enough magnetization which, which, which I will come to very soon and uh, they constitute the bulk motion by bulk motion I mean um, uh, a fluid kind of motion. So uh, many particles together as a coherent structure, they travel. That's what I mean by bulk motion here. They constitute or uh, yeah, they, they constitute the bulk motion as a result of magnetic reconnection. And also the particles are energized. So magnetic reconnection is expected to occur from these uh, first principle uh, force-free uh, and GRMHD simulations. GRMHD means general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. So, uh, so those simulations have shown that magnetic reconnection can indeed occur uh, around the black hole extreme, black, black hole accretion disks and black holes. 
but that still does not do the job. We still haven't answered the question of whether how the particles are energized in the corona. Uh, in order to do that, we need to, to we need to do something called particle in cell simulations of the plasma. Uh, so these are fundamental or uh, first principle kinetic simulations uh, that that follows the trajectories of charged particles in self-consistent electromagnetic fields. And these are computed on a fixed mesh. Uh, basically, what we do is it's, it's a system to, it's a method to solve the coupled Maxwell-Boltzmann equations for a relativistic collisionless plasma. That's what uh, particle in cell simulations are. Um, so before going on to this, uh, does anyone have any question? Um, uh, what were the axes of the previous plot? OK, let me go to the previous one. So, OK, these are just x and z axis in units of gravitational mass. M is, uh, I guess it's, it's gravitational mass or the mass of the black holes. M is basically um, the mass of the black hole. And you can convert the mass of the black hole into, uh, into a, a unit of distance. Gm over c square will give you a distance unit. That's what Z and X are. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, I think Jyotir Aditya have one doubt. You can speak yeah. now. Uh, yes, sir. So I wanted to know what this hard disk and soft disk is, and uh, what those graphs meant. Like, you, yes, this graph and the previous one. This one. Okay. Uh, so um, hard states and soft states are so. I just want you to imagine um, an outburst. So outburst is something where the uh, luminosity increases and then decreases over some periods of time. And during the initial phase of an outburst, the X-rays that we see when you observe a black hole are very highly energetic. And such energetic X-rays are called hard X-rays. And the uh, and that's and that phase is called hard state. And during the uh, peak of an outburst, somewhere over here, the X-rays that we see are low energetic, uh, and they they are called soft X-rays. And uh, that state is called soft state. Okay, and and this graph is for like, uh, what does it say to you? They have more energy, hard state. And, okay. Yeah, yeah. So what this says is, uh, during the onset of an outburst, the luminosity or the brightness is less. Even though the brightness is less, the average energy of the photons that you get is high. On the other hand, during the peak on a peak of an outburst, somewhere over here, the brightness is very very high, but the average energy of a photon is low. That's what this says. Okay. okay, and that brightness is high because there are a lot of photons. Correct. Not the energy is there. Okay. Energy Correct. is not high, but. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Haan, boli. Who's that, Bayar? Uh, anyway, so. Um... Yeah, there okay. are two more raised hands. Um, um, yeah, sure. Shanavi, I can go on. Um, hi, Bayar. Uh, so you said that the black hole emissions carry a thermal spectrum, right? Uh, so I can understand that the accreting matter has some temperature and uh, emits thermally, but does the black hole itself uh, carry a thermal temperature? Um, so let's not get into uh, the Hawking radiation aspects of it, but no, the black hole itself does not uh, uh, emit a thermal radiation that is perceivable by um, existing observing facilities no it does not uh, so what we observe is uh, the spectrum of the matter around the black hole correct correct uh, the spectrum of the matter accreting uh, not the spectrum of the matter around the black hole the spectrum of the x-rays emitted by the matter around the black hole uh, and the corona which is which we think is formed uh, due to the matter accreting around the black hole I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. And there is one more from Ranjan. Ranjan, you can go. 
yeah hello sir uh, i wanted to ask how does the uh, like sharing of inner and outer uh, parts of the disk contribute to the magnetic islands that you spoke of i did not get that part completely okay okay so uh, i get what you're asking so imagine um imagine that the matter is some, some matter is falling as a disk into the black hole okay they are spiraling and the magnetic field lines are connected to the accretion disk some part some some part of the field line so imagine a loop of magnetic field line okay and one leg of the field line is connected to a part of the disk that is closer to the black hole and another leg is connected to, connected to the uh, part of the disk that is away from a black hole okay so the region that is closer to the black hole will have uh, will have a uh, uh, a larger a velocity for example and then the region away will have a smaller velocity so they will shear there, there's going to be a shearing motion so there's going to be a lot of such loops which are undergoing a shearing motion and during due to this shearing motion oppositely oriented field lines can come closer to each other if it's not shearing they are going to move as a as a as a coherent structure but when they are shearing oppositely oriented field lines are going to come closer to each other and as a result um, they will be they, they will reconnect something like this will happen and a consequence of this reconnection is what uh, is this magnetic uh, is the formation of these magnetic islands that you see here uh, right uh, sorry uh, oppositely oriented field lines meaning uh, like i imagine the as you said the uh, inner part is connected to one part of the sort of loop and the uh, loop mm -hmm. the outer part is connected to the other part when the sharing will happen the uh, if i imagine a string uh, so the string will sort of break because uh, like the inner part stretch as in uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, what would happen then sorry uh, the field lines themselves don't uh, break as such but um the the strength of the the, the they, they 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 would they would be in a more tensed situation uh, uh the field lines will be in a tension uh yeah. uh but uh, they, they just can't break and then uh, unless and until certain conditions are met and one of the uh, examples of such breaking and joining is a magnetic is magnetic reconnection right okay uh thank you yeah uh, do you have any other questions or can anyone? Yeah, hello, Bhaiya. Actually, yeah. I just wanted to add on to that Anjan's question. Like, where does this reconnection actually occur? Like, where does Why or where? I mean, uh, while considering the uh, black hole as, as, as a point or something, can we connect this? Like, where do this happen? Where? Okay, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, this simulation shows it right so where is in the sense um it happens about the accretion disk basically um uh i don't know how else to answer this yeah so we have magnetic field lines that are that are coming out of the accretion disk and it happens about the accretion disk which is pretty closer to the black hole and these field lines can also be very close to the uh i'm sorry these reconnection events can also happen close to the jet if you want me to put uh, this in a different context i can show it to you so yeah this is a this is a pretty artistic image you can imagine them to be happening somewhere over here okay um, okay fine fine yes thank you all right um hey so sir, but our, sir, mm -hmm. sir but our original question was what keeps that those in a electrons energized so how does this help like how does this keep it energized yeah, yeah. Uh, i'll come to that okay, so we can uh, continue now yeah so uh magnetic uh, magnetic reconnection they uh impart uh, like i said before they they impart um magnetic reconnection converts the magnetic energy into kinetic energy thermal energy and the particle acceleration uh, and also the bulk motions so we need particle in the simulations of the plasma to actually understand how this energy particle energy energization happens so in order to do that there's uh, in order to do that sincerely there's only one way to go about it which is through particle in the simulations where we saw do this 
there are multiple steps to it, which I'll quickly run through it. Uh, this deserves an entire uh, course, three month course, but I'm just going to quickly skim through it. So we initialize particles and fields in a computational mesh in a grid. So E, Y, B, Z, particles, and so on and so forth. And then the next thing that we do is we advance the magnetic field line by half step forward according to Faraday's law. And then we solve Faraday's law. And then we push particles basically. So we have particles that are uh, that are experiencing Lorentz forces, and these Lorentz forces are going to move the particles. So we push particles in the computational field, uh, and then we advance the magnetic field uh, for the remaining half step, and then uh, up, and then advance the electric field according to Ampere's law. And uh, these are the equations that we solve. So some of you may have some of you may, may know what leapfrog integration is, right? So you, you, uh, there's this numerical mm, numerical methods course that's offered in our physics department. So please do take it. It can be uh, very helpful. So it, it's a it's a way to integrate systems. Um, and then we compute the currents that are produced due to these moving uh, charges. And these currents are then deposited in the grids. So J is a current density. These currents are then uh, deposited in the grids. And then uh, we add these current terms to the Ampere's law. And then uh, we repeat it again. So that's an entire loop, basically. So uh, it's summarized over here. We have the particles. Uh, the uh, position and momentum are updated. Uh, Lorentz force due to, due to the changes given by Lorentz force, and then the charges and currents are deposited in a grid, and then the fields are solved, and then we gather the fields, and then push the particle again. So that's that's the loop. So we are self consistently solving how particles interact with the field, and how the particles uh, and, and how the field interacts due to how the field changes due to the particles, and um, this is very important to uh, to you know, important to uh, understand how particles are energized due to such explosive changes in the magnetic field given uh, given by reconnection. And uh, in order to solve this, we cannot just do it with our pen and paper. We cannot do it with our uh, personal computers. We need uh, big computers, uh, and uh, these can these, these can be very expensive simulations, and they can uh, computationally expensive simulations, which can. Uh, which can consume several millions of CPU hours. So we solve it in NASA's Plaitis, uh, Department of Energy's Cori, and uh, Columbia has three excellent um, supercomputers that we also put into use for these uh, calculations. Um, okay, so we need such fundamental simulations of the plasma in order to understand particle energization. Now what we do is we take a pair plasma, electron positron pair plasma, and we also take electron ion or electron proton uh, pair plasma. So we consider these two to be the uh, constituents of corona. And what we do is we vary magnetizations. Magnetization is uh, defined as the ratio of the energy contained in the magnetic field to the energy contained in the plasma, in the rest or the rest mass energy of the particle sensors. It's just a ratio of how much energy is in the field versus the energy in the particles. So we vary magnetization and we vary the intensity of the soft photon field because uh, if a lot of low energy soft photons impinge the corona, then the corona will be cooled down very fast. Uh, so we change uh, the, the intensity of these uh, soft photons that will get Compton up scattered in order to see how the corona cools. Um, and yeah, this is how uh, the result of, of particle and cell simulation looks. So this is a reconnection event happening. Uh, I, I hope you can uh, see these plasmoids and you can, uh, and you, have, you remember, I'm sure you remember it from the previous slides. Uh, so the reconnection is happening and these plasmoids are pushed away from uh, the center. The first panel shows the number density. The second panel here is the magnetic energy density. And the uh, third panel shows the inverse Compton power carried by the plasma. And the uh, fourth panel shows the, what, what, what is the contribution of the bulk motions to the inverse Compton power. And the fifth panel shows what's the contribution of the temperature or what's the con contribution of the 
uh, internal energy to the total inverse content power. Uh, I, I'll give you a better way to visualize this. Uh, so, so the magnetic reconnection is triggered at the center of the simulation domain, or the, or the box here, over here. Once magnetic reconnection is triggered, so yeah, these are the oppositely oriented field lines. They are first parallel, uh, they come closer, they snap into each other, and the reconnection happens. So I'll just play it here. <clears throat> you see that the plasmoids are being evacuated outside. And then plasma and, and then uh, plasma flows into the layer because there is a vacuum here, and uh, these inflow plasmoids are pulled due to the magnetic tension. This magnetic tension pulls the plasma, and then uh, that's what that's what I happens and that's what I'm showing here in a single snapshot. <coughs> um, I should draw your attention to the difference between these two panels. The, the left one is for strong inverse Compton cooling, and the right one is for weak inverse Compton cooling. And uh, for when uh, at, at strong inverse Compton cooling, which is the regime that is more relevant for a black hole uh, accreting, uh, you can see that the uh, internal motions of the particles or the temperature of the particles is suppressed compared to weak inverse Compton cooling. Okay, this is expected, but this is um, something very important, and we should remember this for the next few slides. Um, so yeah, in, in, uh, in strong okay, what this shows is what, what the bulk outflow momentum is. So this is not talking anything about the temperature of the particles themselves, but it just shows what the bulk motions are. Uh, Please remind yourself of the difference between bulk motions and the internal motions. Internal motions mean how random the motions are. It, it's, a, it's a measure of the temperature. Bulk motion is uh, just says how, how, how fast the entire system is moving or the plasmas are moving. Um, so at, at, at the center where the reconnection is triggered, the bulk motions are small. And as you go away from the region where the reconnection is triggered, the bulk motions are uh, larger. And uh, the important part is, regardless of what the magnetization is, or regardless of uh, how much energy sits in the magnetic field lines, as long as it is much greater than 1, you see that the bulk, this, OK, this is the 4 momentum, OK? ux is gamma beta x gamma is the lorentz factor beta is the uh, is v over c so it's a four momentum uh, the bulk motions the bulk momentum uh, is constant for for a wide range of uh, inverse compton cooling strengths uh, which is very interesting uh, similar bulk outflow speed regardless of magnetization and inverse compton cooling strength uh, <clears throat> However, if you look at the internal motions, which is which I show by the blue lines, the internal energies are reduced to non-relativistic temperatures. So this is in units of MEC squared. MEC squared is uh, 511 keV. Uh, that's the rest mass energy of electrons. Okay, that's that's the unit that I'll be using to measure temperature now. Uh, the internal energies are uh, reduced to non-relativistic temperatures, uh, at 5 keV or something. And under strong cooling, and uh, so they cannot really Compton upscatter because the Compton upscattered radiation uh, goes to several several tens or even hundreds of keV in uh, energy. So these electrons are very efficiently cooled in the corona. So these electrons cannot upscatter soft photons due to their thermal motions themselves because they are they are cooled down. So something else must be uh, Compton upscattering them. Uh, note that the energy in the bulk motion, the red lines, is barely affected when you increase the cooling levels. Uh, maybe I will quickly skip this slide. Uh, I don't know if we have time. If we have time, I'll get back to it. Uh, so that's the, the second experiment that one can do is we change the composition of the corona uh, from electron positron pair plasma to also adding uh, protons into it. Uh, one effect of adding proton is that um, the magnetization can go very low because 
the magnetization parameter is dependent on the mass of the plasma. In an electron positron plasma, this is the Me is the mass of the electron. But if you add protons to it, the magnetization can go down by 2000 because the ratio of electrons to pro protons mass is 1 over 1836. So if you add protons to it, then uh, we should be getting similar effects with a much lower magnetization. And that's what we see here. Uh, the dashed lines show the uh, lower magnetization case with electrons and ions corona. And the uh, dotted lines show what the, the effect of uh, magnetic reconnection on the bulk motion, on the internal motions for uh, a larger magnetization. So you see that, uh, as we expect, in the presence of protons, even a lower magnetization can give rise to bulk motion that matches a highly magnetized corona, uh, provided that the low magnetization has protons in it. So yeah, the takeaway from this is, I don't want to confuse you more here. The takeaway from this is that bulk motion of cold electrons. The, the first thing is that the electrons are cooled down. So the electrons are themselves not hot. And so they cannot come and upscatter these hot photons. These cool electrons, the, they, they have translativistic bulk motions. And, the bulk, and these bulk motions, even in a weakly magnetized plasma, can participate in compartmentalization. And uh, that's the big takeaway from this, that the, it's not the random motion of the electrons that's, that's compton up scattering, but it's the uh, fluid motion of the uh, cold electrons that is <clears throat> giving rise to uh, the hard X-ray spectrum. So it, it's not that we are speculating. It's, we, we, we're just not speculating this. We also uh, um, have compared it with observations, OK? So the blue and orange lines are observed X-ray spectra, OK? The, the X axis, the energy, it goes from 1 keV to 1 MeV and beyond. And Y axis is the um, flux in some sense. Um, the energy here in units of mc squared. The dotted and dashed lines are the X-ray Spectrum, inverse Compton upscattered X-ray spectra that we obtain from our uh, first principle uh, simulations for different magnetizations. And you see, yeah, so in order to produce this, we perform, uh, one has to perform a Monte Carlo simulation of X-ray emission during particle in cell simulations. Um, certain assumptions have been made here on what the seed temperature, the, the fo seed photon temperature from the accretion disk is. Uh, that's assumed to be 0.5 keV, and so on and so forth. So the takeaway from this one is that um, for a magnetization of 10, you can very, you can remarkably explain the uh, observed X-ray spectrum, which is uh, which is powered by magnetic reconnection. Um, yeah, I think I will. Um, wrap up with this slide and then uh, I'll open for open up for any questions. So for large soft photon flux, so the soft photons are coming from the accretion disk, soft X-rays. So this is the magnetic reconnection happening over here. You have the magnetic field lines uh, that are anchored onto the accretion disk. Oppositely oriented field lines reconnect and they give rise to these uh, reconnection chains of plasmoids uh, that we think constitutes the corona. So these soft X-rays uh, impinge this corona, and they get compton upscattered due to bulk motions of these plasmoids, uh, which contain cold electrons, however. And uh, this compton upscattered emission is what, is what we think we see as uh, hard X-rays or hard non-thermal X-rays. So for large soft from flux, particles are cooled down to non-relativistic temperatures for all magnetizations. Uh, their bulk outflows, however, remain translativistic. So the bulk outflows themselves do not much care about uh, how, how many soft photons hit them. However, the internal motions of the electrons here, they care. They are cooled down. And the particle's energy spectrum, uh, which is dominated by its bulk motion, resembles a 100 kV Maxwellian. 
and this bulk motion of cold electrons can upscatter soft photons and produce the observed hard x-rays. Um, yeah, uh, that's the overall big picture. Um, I'm happy to go over any slides or take any questions. <clears throat> Yeah, so yeah, that was a very wonderful talk. Thank you, Vaya. Uh, so now we can start with the Q&A session. You guys can unmute yourself and ask your questions, or you can write in the chat box. I guess there are many questions in the chat box that I haven't addressed. Uh, maybe Gauro, can you? Yeah, I will. I will. Yes, so, uh, or there is one by. Even Mark. they can uh, unmute themselves and ask now. But yeah, whatever. Yeah. So there's one question by Paramita D. Um, mm -hmm. She is asking Shouldn't the count spectrum follow a power law because of non thermal emission, the hard and soft uh, state graphs? Absolutely. That's a very good question. Yes, they do. I've shown it here. Uh, the hard, the hard non-thermal uh, spectrum, it does follow a power law. It does follow a power law with an index of 1.5. So this is EFE, so it's 0.5. But if you just <laughs> look at uh, what the number of photons are for a given energy, it goes as <clears throat> uh, N of E, it goes as E to the gamma, and this gamma power law index is usually minus 1.5, yes. And uh, remarkably, uh, these uh, the solution that we propose here it also explains uh, the expected power law index of non thermal emission. Uh, hi, so my question was in the previous slide uh, mm -hmm. the hard and the soft state graphs which you were showing. I could not see any power law. I mean, I won't call them power law, they were probably log parabola, but not a power law, so that's what my question was. Okay, you're talking about this? Yeah, these ones. Ah, so okay, like the uh, purple one is a log parabola, red is also not a power law, and yeah, the other uh, ones are thermal ones. Uh, so. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I get your point. Uh, so uh, these, are, uh, these are multiplied by several other uh, factors in the y-axis for visual representation. So uh, so, so, so don't worry much about it. Uh, the actual spectrum is... Is a spectral energy distribution? OK. Uh, this is the... This is what shows it much you know, in a much better way. This is what you also see in the previous one, uh, but uh, not in a very... Not, not in a language that, that emphasizes the power law better, but in a different language, yeah. OK, so this bump, which we are getting at uh, like 1,000 kilo electron volt or 100 kilo electron volt, probably, uh, this is due to inverse Compton scattering. Um, right. So uh, what observers have been doing is that they, they, have, they, they look at this uh, peak of the uh, non-thermal emission uh, somewhere over here. And then they, they, they interpret this peak as the temperature of the electrons that is giving rise to uh, the hard non-thermal emission. So, OK, uh, people have been thinking with, oh, that, OK, the, the, the corona has electrons and positrons of 100 kV temperature. That's what they have been thinking. Okay. Uh, and 100 kV temperature electrons come and upscatter these soft photons, and then they give rise to non-thermal emission. That's what they're thinking, that they were thinking. Uh, but when you look at this, this shows the particle energy spectrum that we observe that we obtained from our plasma simulations right um, the energy of the uh, bulk component the brown ones the brown okay just observe the brown lines here if you look at the energy spectrum of the bulk portions they are well described by a maxwellian with a 100 kV temperature it's a 100 kV maxwellian so it's perhaps not actually the temperature of the electrons and positrons at 100 kV, but it's the energy spectrum of the bulk motions, uh, which resemble a Maxwellian distribution, which peaks at 100 kV. So that's what uh, uh, 
Give us rice to this non Tamils from picking at 100 kg. Okay, all right. So <laughs> basically, if uh, so for a non thermal spectrum like uh, i just want to understand that in an accretion disk we mostly have electron protons right and uh, not electron positrons in the so, accretion disk uh that's a good point uh when you have reconnection happening uh, at some uh, phase and this reconnection gives rise to uh, hard photons after a limit when the energy in exceeds 11 keV uh, for example somewhere over here these photons can pair produce they can gamma gamma interaction gamma is photon basically excessive gamma ray photons they can produce pairs and these pair production is a self consistent process that is expected due to reconnection because the reconnection in the system because reconnection energy is particles and these particles uh, come from scattered soft photons to high energies, and these highly energetic photons pair produce. They produce electron positron pairs. That's how you get electron positrons here. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, good questions. Thank you. Um, there is one in the chat box uh, by Jyoti Raditya. So he's saying so this outburst happens over the disk rather than above the black hole and we observe this outburst as hard disk uh, outburst mm. uh, I, 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 can you repeat the question so maybe I uh, so so this outburst outburst mm -hmm. happens over the disk rather than above the black hole and we observe this outburst as a black uh, hard disk outburst it's hard disk outburst um, Jyotira, if you can unmute and ask, that would be better. So, yeah, this picture, in this picture, uh, uh, next, next slide. Now the, yes. So mm -hmm. we were looking for that, uh, the stream. We are finding what, uh, why the energy in, of the electrons is mm -hmm. energized in that stream. But, uh, uh, what uh, you said that uh, this uh, magnetic field lines they mm. reconnect and then due to inverse Compton effect uh, it re uh, it outbursts. So it's not happening outside the black hole. No, it's like surrounded within the disk. Now is this picture relevant to what's actually happening? Mm. This is a cartoon, uh, so this is not uh, a real image of a black hole extreme. You first should clarify that. <laughs> so um, I'm just using this cartoon to uh, sh show two main components of a black hole accretion disk system. So the black hole accretion disk system contains a few, few major regions. One is the accretion disk that is accreting matter. Uh, and, th and this accretion disk gives, gives rise to the back body X-rays. And the second region is uh, corona above the accretion disk or above the black hole, or uh, it, it, it uh, sandwiches the accretion disk and black hole. We don't really exactly know the geometry of the corona. That's, that's still a big problem. So, I'm, uh, so I've just denoted some region uh, that is not the accretion disk, that is above the accretion disk as the corona. And there are, I, I, I guess, the outbursts and this uh, regions, they are definitely related. Uh, when outburst happens, there are some instabilities that occur uh, in the accretion disk and plasma instabilities and viscous instabilities, for example. And these instabilities uh, give rise to uh, large luminosities and uh, they they also give rise to many bubbling up of field lines outside the accretion disk and these uh, field lines that bubble outside the accretion disk uh, is what constitutes the corona um i don't really know how else to uh okay 
at the outburst and the geometry that you're asking maybe if i have misunderstood your question please clarify okay i got this is just a artist uh, illustration yeah 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 so the uh, yeah the corona does not necessarily have to be at the base of this jet oh yeah the third component is the jet it does not necessarily have to be the base of the jet it's just an artistic uh, conception just to make things life easier uh, the corona is just spread across the black hole accretion disk above the accretion disk and below the accretion disk basically and above the black hole everywhere so yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you uh, next we have bhavna Uh, she is asking what packages you used to perform the monte carlo simulations basically she is trying to work something like this out for a mwl observation for a quasar and yeah that's why she wants to know mwl what is mwl observation anyway so uh, hi bhavna you have something to add yeah hi uh, multi wavelength observation basically so i am uh, trying to uh, basically get the spectral fit mm -hmm. across all wavelengths so i'm basically i'm working on x ray and gamma gamma ray mm -hmm. flux point so i was wanting to ask if i mean um what package did you use did you use by i mean a package in python or any other um coding language to um plot your plot the scd using since you mentioned that <clears throat> that you have used monte carlo simulations so like did you code okay. it but are you following any code i think yeah sure uh, so there are three different tools uh, that are used in producing this okay uh, the first thing mm -hmm. is our particle and cell simulations itself they are uh, written I, i use a code called tristan mp uh, it's written in fortran um and that's what we use for performing these first principle particle cell plasma simulations these simulations they tell you uh, the momentum of the particles right so you, you you get the energy of the particles the next thing that we do is we uh, use a monte carlo simulation that's also a, a locally written code uh, it's not a package that i use so it's, it's a locally written code um we use this monte carlo code to basically inject some photons into the reconnection layer so you have a reconnection layer that is formed due to reconnection we see that from plasma simulations uh, it has all the information required about the energy of the particles we inject some photons into it and then we track the photons in some sense and then see what the energy of the photons are when they come out of this reconnection uh, reconnection region that's what is that's what the monte carlo uh, simulation does and it's it's not publicly available it's it's a local uh, code for that and uh, the other tool that is used here uh, is to observe is to make sense of the observed uh, data <coughs> uh, the observed data can be analyzed using uh, a very common and popular package called hiasoft high energy astrophysics software it, it's a yes yes yeah there, are, yeah there are multiple tools with uh, within hiasoft which which you can use for example xpec chronos and many many yeah. tools which you can use for analyzing the observed x-ray data um yeah okay yeah okay uh, i was modeling uh, so basically for my master thesis i'm modeling the jet the mm -hmm. the processes that go on the uh, influx <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, outflow of out, outflow for uh, photons from the jet so basically the same processes so the x-ray regime is more or less the same as what you mentioned in your talk and the gamma ray is like what we are working on so i'm mm -hmm. modeling the um, gamma ray flares of a particular quasar so randomly like it, it's 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 the, uh, uh, around the same analogy as the uh, gamma ray burst <laughs> you can say so that's why i was asking this particular question um, um okay thank you do you do you have any recommendations on um monte carlo chains i mean yeah uh, monte carlo chains for to uh, plot these scs and things like any any recommendations that you can give that i can look at are you aware um, of something so um first of all yeah th that's a that's a very exciting project bavna i'm happy for you um uh, uh, I'm happy to, to touch base with you on any of 
your problem. So happy to discuss about that if you want. So <clears throat> uh, I would actually need more information uh, about what exactly you're working on to um, to answer your second part of the question about my suggestions for a Monte Carlo package because uh, Monte Carlo is a very broad uh, topic which can have wide variety of applications. If you are, for example, uh, trying to do some X-ray analysis and X-ray fits, and if you want to do some Monte Carlo simulations to check if your X-ray models are fitting the observations properly, there are different tools to do, to, to, to do that. If you want to do uh, a Monte Carlo ray tracing simulation, there are different tools to, 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 to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, I can't really answer that uh, until yeah. more details about it. I'm happy to discuss yeah. later. Uh, definitely. I mean, I will send you an email and like, I'll give you an abstract of what I'm doing. That would make it easier for you to give me a recommendation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All the Thank best. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Kavin. Um, he's asking, are plasmoids clumps of plasma that get ripped and uh, thrown out of the plane of the accretion disk or denser clumps of plasma within the accretion disk or concentration of low energy electrons that underwent inverse uh, Compton effect? That's a good clarification uh, question, Kevin. I should have explained that better. Um, so it's the first and third option, not the second one. So plasmoids are not clumps within the accretion disk, inside the accretion disk. These are the coherent magnetic structures which contain plasma inside them, which are thrown out of not the accretion disk, but they are thrown out of the reconnection, um, the central point where the reconnection occurs. Uh, so some, some plasmoids can even approach the accretion disk and some plasmoids are thrown out of the accretion disk. Uh, yeah. And yeah, the cold electrons and positrons are not exactly in the accretion disk and they, that they are sitting inside the plasmoids here, over here. So pe people have been thinking that these uh, pair plasma over here, they are hot, but we just show that they are, they cannot be hot uh, due to the soft X-rays and the cold pair plasma is inside these plasmoids and these plasmoids are, uh, are catapulted in some sense at translativistic speeds uh, from the uh, point where reconnection occurs. If the reconnection occurs over here, they are, they, are, they are thrown away in these directions. Of course, another uh, thing that you should remember is that these are not one dimensional structures. So it's, it's, a, it's a two dimensional plane in some sense. Uh, so it's not a spherical thing that, that I call as plasmoid over here, but rather it's a tube. It's a tube of plasma. Kevin, uh, is, is it clear? Do uh, you, you need any other clarifications? Yeah, I yeah, got it. Thank you. OK, that's all the questions in the chat box. If there is any more question, then yeah, you, can, you guys can ask. Yeah, so Navin Bhaiya, we are uh, like you guys uh, ran the Monte Carlo simulations on the observations uh, till now, like what observations we have till now. Like uh, we can also simulate data no, through Monte Carlo and check whether uh, our proposition works better or not. Like uh, this bulk motion. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we do. These uh, Monte Carlo simulations of X-ray uh, emission. They, so we run Monte Carlo simulations on the other simulations that we have run. So uh, that's exactly what we do. We here we are not um, running Monte Carlo simulations on the observed X-ray photons. Uh, to yeah, we basically make synthetic data. Yeah, uh, on based on some parameters. Uh, correct. So we we 
we find we find the we find how the particles are energized from our first principle particle plasma simulations and then and then on that simulation we run a monte carlo simulation to get the x-ray spectrum uh, and once we get the x-ray spectrum the inverse compton of scattered x-ray spectrum we compare that simulated spectrum with observations yes okay thank you Uh, so we are already past one hour. So if there are no more questions, maybe we can wrap up this session. Um, uh, uh, thanks for uh, all your wonderful questions. Um, and I'm always, of course, happy to uh, chat with you all over email. And if you have any questions about not only about this this research or about anything uh, else that pertains to your academics, I'm happy to discuss about that too. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm back again. Yeah. Thank you, Vaya. That was a very wonderful talk. And thank you, everyone, for joining in.